for a closer look of the history and future of coffee, we'll be joining a family-owned company that's making coffee in Philadelphia since 1854. And for today's menu, I will be preparing coffee-infused diaper scallops served on a lobster leek sauce, coffee roasted beef tenderloin, hearts of celery braised with marrow, and for dessert, a spectacular coffee cake. All for a fresh food taste of history. For my first recipe, I'm using live lobster, which obviously would have been available anytime in the 18th century. And I'm absolutely convinced that this dish would have been served short of the coffee because Philadelphia in 1793, 10% of its population was French. So having this particular dish with what we call a sauce américain would have been most likely found on Second Street. For the first step, I have to kill a live lobster, but I'm doing it in the most humane way that I know. Okay, now we go to the fire. You notice that I put the cognac in a glass bowl, not pouring from the bottle, because it create a Molotov cocktail effect and can be very dangerous. So if you do this at home, put your liquor in a separate bowl and then put it in. Nice job. That's for the, for the memory books. Flambe in my hand, perfect. I told you it's a hot recipe, but you also saw how dangerous it can be if you pour the liquor straight from the bottle, so be careful. We're adding in some myrrh and some white wine in there. Now I'm making the, the base of where later the scallops will be nested on. I want to take the bottom part of the leek, I don't want the, the green because they'll get bitter. I'm taking them. The finer you can do it, the better it is for the recipe. And it goes into a dachi with a little bit of butter while I'm cutting the cremini mushroom. It's going to be in a slow little fire. Cremini are one of my favorite mushrooms. And what I want to take the stem off, now the stem I would never discard. I would make a, a stock or even a mushroom soup when you strain it. But if this recipe is too delicate to put a stem in it, because the stem are much tougher than the actual rest of the mushroom. And it goes back on top of the leek. Very slow simmer. You see how the, the lobster cooks neatly down? You can obviously not smell it, you don't have smell of vision, but boy, I tell you. A little bit of stock, just a little chicken stock. And now the fun begins. And that is the coffee infusion. Scallops are very sweet. So this is the sugar for my coffee. I have a needle. All I'm doing is I take a reduction of coffee and I insert it in to the scallop. But you want to insert as much as you can take. It will start bleeding a little bit. You let it sit for a while so that the coffee flavor will penetrate the scallops. Many people in my restaurant call me dark. Maybe that's why. So my cremini and leeks are sitting right here in beautiful flavor. The scallops have had maybe 15, 20 minutes for the coffee reduction to penetrate the scallop. It's gonna go in a skillet but literally only one turn. Matter of fact, most people eat those scallops raw like that or just as a ceviche. Just a little bit of butter. No more fire for today, I had enough. Nice sizzle. So as I mentioned, I want one turn. You can see how the coffee is bleeding out a little bit. It's perfectly normal. It's coming right to the landing in two seconds. Beautiful, beautiful. 
perfect. I have one extra one in there. It's for the chef to taste. Spectacular, it's the only word I can say. It was so cool, so good. The lobster flavor has cooked out. It's enough reduced down. The lobster sauce, the reduction, all the goodness from earlier. Sprinkle parsley on that, a lemon. It's my scallops infused with coffee. Serve me the lobster American. Coffee's history goes back well beyond the discovery of the New World. Legend says that an Ethiopian goat herder noticed his goats would dance after eating a certain fruit in the field. Unknowingly feeling the effects of caffeine, that fruit turned out to be the coffee bean. It wasn't until the 1700s that coffee would begin appearing in the British colonies. Much like in London, these coffee houses became centers of trade, uplifting the spirits of its residents and fueling new ideas. Bags of unroasted coffee beans were brought into cities like Philadelphia by ship and then roasted by the many small businesses along the Delaware River. This process continued into the 19th century, where one such company's unique history found its grounds, Ellis Coffee. One of the things we're very proud of is our history, obviously, all the way back to 1854. It was owned by a man named Alan Cuthbert, and he had a shop on Philadelphia's waterfront. He was selling coffee and spices and teas and everything else, and sold it in 1871 to Francis Bond. Francis Bond hired an assistant to help him run that same very store named John Ellis. At the time, John Ellis was only a, an 11-year-old boy. And unfortunately, Francis Bond passed away when John Ellis was only 12 or 13. John had really learned everything there was to know about coffee and eventually took over the store and Ellis Coffee was born. The young, ambitious Ellis successfully ran the business until 1952, when it was sold to the Strauss family. Over the years, the company has combined their passion for coffee with the expertise of a family-owned business. I feel very lucky that my great-grandfather and then my grandfather and then my father successfully ran the business for as long as they did. The tenderloin of beef is by many people considered the best cut of the animal. So if you would buy a whole tenderloin, you would want to take the chain off on the side, like so. This is the head of the filet. You're going to concentrate on the heart, which is about this piece over here. And all you want to do is clean it really good, take the excess fat off. And then you take what we call silver skin, just peel it off like so. You have coffee. I hand ground it in a modern pestle. They got some done already. So all I'm gonna do is take the coffee. Now this I would sit overnight to perfume the meat so the coffee essence can penetrate it, and it will, because the tenderloin is the finest cut. Behind me I got a Dutch getting hot. All I'm gonna put in is some oil, and then the tenderloin, and we're gonna cook this very slow for the fire. You notice I put no salt on it, because salt will make it dry. I'll turn it over, let it cook for a little bit. You want to make sure when you do it, you don't burn the coffee. And now I'm going to deglaze a little red wine. You're going to lid it. And then you want to set it next to the fire. It'll get enough heat to cook while I'm getting ready for the next part of my fantastic recipe. The wedge table I picked for today's menu is actually a play of words, because it's also called the heart of the celery, and we also have the heart of the beef, so two hearts together. So you cut the, the stalks off, shave the little piece on the bottom that was cut before, 
like so, and then cut it in half. You want to leave the core in it so it doesn't fall apart. If you cut it loose, you have just celery sticks. I'm taking it over to my 18th century sink. Yeah. Celery has a tendency to have a lot of sand on the bottom of the wood, so this is done that. Now it goes to the fire. So my hearts of celery have been blanching for about five to eight minutes. You don't want more than that. Now, if you like vegetables completely done, or not al dente like I like them, maybe give it 15 minutes. Take my kitchen fork, and I put the blanched hearts of celery into my 18th century roasting pan. A couple dollops of butter, right on the bottom. For some people who have never seen what Mero looks like, one is the center cut, and the other one is the long cut. So now comes the trick. It's very easy to push through it. So now, ideally have a warm knife, so I'm gonna cut and lay this right on top of the celery. The marrow will melt in the oven and gives this unbelievable flavor. A little bit of salt. Salt, pepper, and now. White wine, because you don't uh, want the celery to burn. Before I put it in, last moment, I wanna put some Parmesan cheese, finely grated over, and gives this extraordinary flavor. And now we can go in the beehive. Be eight to 15 minutes, depends how much cooked you want your celery to be. Until golden brown on top, or just melted. I'm just sauteing some beans. I don't even blanch them. All I want to do, some butter in my dutchie, and some shallots. And get a nice dear of salt and pepper, and be ready to serve it up. A little chicken stock. This is the fastest way that I know to cook green beans. The coffee roasted tenderloin is ready. I want to have it nice, medium rare. Beautiful. So now the coffee reduction. Now put a little cream in here. Take this back to the fire. Just want to give it a little bit just to get the heat up. So I reduced it down by at least two thirds. A little bit of cream, not a lot, just about so. Perfect. A little taste. Oh, the flavor. The coffee in the back, not too spicy, a lot of flavor of the beef that was cooked in there. It's really good. Parsley, just a little bit. Beautiful. Okay, let's put it on my platter. There's my braised heart of celery, maybe a little bit of parsley on top. And this completes my tripod to coffee. We have the beautiful infused scallops with coffee. We have the lobster. We have the beef tenderloin, marinated in coffee and green beans. And we have the celery heart with marrow and Parmesan cheese. So good. Adam. Chef. So good to meet you. Welcome. I've been cooking up a storm today, but now finally I'm here where it all begins. You're exactly right, Chef. This is where it all begins. This is where we bring in coffees from farms all over the world that we've been dealing with for decades. Bring in coffees from Costa Rica to Guatemala to Colombia. So I'm really excited to show you what we do here. Let's get started. Let's go. So here we have the first part of the process, which is the dumping station. So what we do, Chef, actually, is we slice the bags when they're on the platform, and then gravity takes over, and the beans just simply fall down through the grate into this tube below the platform, which takes the green coffee, the raw coffee, up and over and down into this green bean cleaner. You have a state-of-the-art facility, but the philosophy has not changed. That's absolutely right. The technology allows us to provide the same quality cup of coffee every single time. And you have a secret weapon. It's called a family-owned business. That's right. 
After we've gone through and, and cleaned the coffee, it gets blown up into our 16 storage bins that store 8,000 pounds of coffee each. And basically, the dolly here goes up and down collecting pounds of coffee from each different type of coffee. We'll drop it over into one of these two bins on the ground here. Once the recipe has been made and we've pulled the, the different various components to make the blend, we blow it over to our roasting department. Coffee roasting is an art and a science. Every bean from every different location has a different characteristic to it. Every crop from every location has a different characteristic to that. It's a chemical process that happens inside the roaster. And so it's very important to roast the coffee at a consistent temperature and a consistent rate with a consistent airflow across it. After it comes out of the roaster, we're tasting it, we're testing it, and making sure every roast is perfect. But in the end of the day, it's also later the flavor profile that you want to get. So from here, quality control, we're, ta we're tasting coffee. Gotcha. It's all about the taste. We're in our quality control lab, and in our mini sample roasters, we get a pre-shipment sample of about two pounds, and we will roast up some of the coffee so we can taste before we decide that we want to bring it in for one of our blends. So the process of that is we roast the coffee, we grind it up, and we put about seven grams in a cup. And instead of the traditional way of brewing coffee, we actually just take hot water and we pour it over the ground coffee. Coffee has a very distinct aroma. And so we actually stir it up and smell the coffee. And based on where it's from, we have certain uh, characteristics of the smell, of the taste, of the body, of the texture that we expect. Why six cups? So chef, we actually do six cups to make sure that each one of these is tasting the way it's supposed to. It's very interesting. So now what's the next step besides letting it cool off a little bit? We're going to take a shallow spoon of coffee. We're going to slurp it in so it really gets to the back of our, t our tongue. So it really hits all of the taste buds, really pick up the flavor, and then we're going to spit it in the spittoon. Let me dry it. So you take it off the top? Yep. Stir it around. And we're going to spit it out. Very pleasant flavor, though. Very pleasant flavor, right? And so that flavor you should pick up in every cup the same consistent way. So Adam, you know I have a restaurant right down the street, you know, in the city I've tower. Heard that. And I want you to come by so we can do a little more tasting. Not this kind of tasting, but the final product tasting. Looking forward to it. Let's do it. Diana, you're starting without me. Eh, just barely. Good to see you. That's Diana, my pastry chef in the City Tavern. I just came back from Ellis Coffee where they're roasting coffee beans and it's such a beautiful flavor. Well, the perfect go with for coffee is coffee cake. There you go. So that is what we have here today. Coffee cake is not as we think of it now with this buttery streusel topping and very rich and uh, sour, sour cream laden <laughs> base. Um, this is an 18th century recipe which really at the time meant cake that you have with coffee, typically a quicker cake, like a quick bread or something like that. So that is exactly what we're gonna do here. For this particular recipe, I made sure I found one that has coffee in it, and then we're really just gonna take it one step over the edge and do a coffee whipped cream on the side. So, coffee, coffee, coffee. Can never have enough coffee. Or butter, so that's butter. what we're gonna start with. We have just a little bit of butter here. Get that into our bowl, big bowl. It's nice and soft, as you can see. I just wanna get it started moving around so that we add our brown sugar. It doesn't have to be a full on cream, but you do want the butter and the sugar to be thoroughly mixed before you add your egg. Now you could make this in a kitchen machine, right? Oh, absolutely. One of the spoils of the uh, yeah. not 18th century is having machines do our work for us. Never on a taste of history. Never, you know never, never. Just one egg. Wonderful. Get this good and light in color. Add a little bit of molasses, a lot of bit of molasses actually. This is gonna offer a good dark color to the cake. And of course that lovely rich molasses yeah. taste. And now comes the coffee. And the flavor is ready. Now this coffee you just reduced. Nope, this is just good, strong coffee, coffee, about a half a cup. Of course, you don't want it to be boiling hot. 
warm is fine, but definitely not fresh out of the pot. Now, I'm gonna scoot that over and work with our dry ingredients. We have some flour here, all purpose is fine. We have a little allspice here, just put that in. We have some freshly ground mace in here, and some cinnamon, and a little bit of cocoa powder. It's lovely flavor profile. I'm just gonna stir that together with my finger. Again, evenly distributing those spices throughout the flour. And to that, we will add some dried currants and some candied orange peel. So now you made the wet with the dry. That's right, with one last ingredient. This is just a little bit of baking soda dissolved in equal parts water. So we're gonna put that in. And now, two become one. The dry. And it doesn't take long for this to come together and you don't wanna over mix it, otherwise you end up with uh, not a lovely, you know, moist, moist, cake. moist yeah. cake. You end up with a brick, which nobody likes bricks with their coffee. The flavor is amazing for the molasses, mm. the coffee, mm. and the spices you got in there, it's like. Good coffee color, oh. dark brown. All right, so we have our bunt pan here. Uh, covered with just a little bit of butter and flour so that the coffee cake doesn't stick when we take it out. All right, we get this last couple scoops. That's called adding some spin to your coffee cake, huh? That's right. Give it a little tap, even it out, shake it around. And let the beehive it goes. How long How long we bake beehive. it? A moderate oven for 40 minutes. It'll be springy and start to pull away from the sides. Take some heavy cream, we make a whipped cream that's coffee infused. Once you see how easily this whipped cream comes together, you will never, ever, ever buy shaving ready. lotion. <laughs> buy, buy the tube stuff. That's right, no more ready whip, no more cool whip. Just takes a little elbow grease, a whisk in a bowl. The sugar, not too much. So Diana, do this. This is a coffee reduction. So all I did was take about two cups of coffee with a, a little bit of sugar and a little bit of vanilla that went in afterwards and I just reduced it down to about a half a cup. This coffee reduction offers a lightly sweet but very strong coffee flavor. I happen to like apricot, apricot brandy because it balances well with the cake. Wonderful. Another little whip. Okay, let's cut the cake. All right, our cake is out and cooled. Again, it baked in a moderate oven, 325 or so, for 40 minutes. And as you can see, it's pulled away from the sides and it's perfectly cool now. So we're gonna go ahead and flip it out onto our plate and I'll cut us a slice, what do you yep. say? And I got a whipped cream ready. Great, voila. Beautiful. I garnish it with a little uh, whipped cream, 18th century comes to life right there. Mm -hmm. mm. Now all we need is a cup of coffee. This is absolutely delicious. Diana, what a great job. What a unique coffee cake. Most people will say, wow, it's a coffee cake. Yes, it's a coffee cake. Back from the 18th century. That's right. Adam, it's good to have you on my tour this time. Chef, thank you. We're sitting here actually in the coffee room of the city tavern, which was uh, first opened in 1773. The coffee is as important as the appetizer. It's the finale of a great meal. So a good cup of coffee is essential. Such a great balance of flavors in there. That's our passion, Chef, that fantastic, extraordinary cup of coffee. Oh, look who's here. Here you're having coffee without my delicious coffee cakes. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Coffee cake, our days are all kinds of different cakes, be it, be it banana walnut, be it uh, pound cake, mm -hmm. lemon pound cake. This happens to be the cake which actually uses coffee in the mix of it. That's my type of coffee cake. It's really interesting and has a currant in it. Beautiful flavor. Delicious. Just to get it with your coffee. I really want to thank you for allowing us a behind the scenes look and the mystique of roasting coffee. Chef, thank you. It's been my honor. All for a taste of history. <laughs>